Hi everyone, this is Alan McKay. Welcome to episode 129. I'm speaking with Jason Martin, the creature lead for id Software on Doom. Let's dive in. Welcome to the Alan McKay Podcast. Alan is an Emmy Award-winning visual effects artist and mentor to many leading industry experts. Listen in as Alan talks with other industry leaders in film, video games, and visual effects about their experience, lessons, and methodology. Alan will teach you pivotal advice to fast-track your career, better your skills, and reach your ultimate dream job. Check out the latest episodes on alanmckay.com. Okay, welcome to episode 129. I'm really excited for this episode to be finally coming out. We actually did it quite a while ago, and this is an episode with Jason Martin, who is the creature lead on Doom over at id Software. He's also worked for a lot of other really amazing studios, Blur Studio being one of them, and we go really heavy into a lot of his background, how he got to where he is today, as well as just a lot of insights into his workflow and also the workflow in game development specifically on Doom as well. So we get into a lot of different stuff. I think that this is one that we're all going to be able to benefit a lot from. And I'm excited to finally get this episode out. So that being said, a couple of things coming up that I'm really psyched for. If you haven't signed up for the It's Art Masterclass or IAMAG Masterclass in Paris in March, um, there's still time to do that. I'm going to be speaking there alongside a lot of really talented people. Facebook's actually going to be sponsoring the event alongside a lot of other great sponsors too. Goro Fujita is going to be uh, doing another talk there this year. Goro is a super talented artist. You might have seen the work that he's done with Quill creating really immersive worlds inside of VR. So, um, I think that that episode, when we finally do it, is going to be really killer. Uh, I was really inspired by his work uh, last year when he was speaking at the event. Uh, it was a lot of fun. And in addition, good friend of mine, Maggie O, who is at ILM XLab these days. She's worked previously for NVIDIA, I think Pixar and ILM and a dozen other places. Super genius in her field. And um, she's going to be speaking at the event as well. Um, Chris Costia, who's the head modeler for ILM. There's going to be a lot of really amazing speakers at this event. So I'm going to have a lot of fun uh, hanging out with everyone uh, and hopefully you as well. So if you're coming to the event, it'll be a three-day event mid-March. So if you want to check out the show notes, I'll leave a link to sign up there. So the show notes are alanmckay.com slash 129. So 129. And I'll leave links to everything else that Jason and I talk about in this episode as well. Okay, so that being said, hang around for the end of this episode. I've got a few really cool announcements, but that being said, I hope you enjoyed this episode with Jason. Let's dive in. Okay, just quickly, one of the biggest problems that we face as artists is figuring out how much we're worth. Typically, the situation is that we go on a job interviews and we're asked how much we're going to charge. We either shoot ourselves in the foot by saying that we charge less than we're worth, so that way we get the gig and indirectly end up leaving tens of thousands of dollars accumulatively over time on the table rather than actually asking what we should be charging. At the same time, you don't want to alienate your employers by asking for too much and leaving yourself out in the cold. So what I've done is I put together a website, check it out, www.vfxrates.com. And this is a chance for you to be able to put in your experience, your discipline, the location you're working, all the good things that will give you a fairly accurate idea of what you and everyone else should be charging in your discipline. This is something that I'm going to continue to build and flesh out over time. But the key thing is actually that I don't want to just showcase how much you should be worth but also show you and hand you the tools to grow beyond that and to learn to negotiate better, to learn to ask for the the right amount of money in the right way. There's lots of additional tools and information I want to hand over to you. Everything's free. Check it out, vfxrates.com. Put in your information and you'll instantly get notified of how much money you should be charging per hour as a VFX artist. vfxrates.com. Thanks again for doing this. And do you want to give a quick introduction? Uh, yeah, yeah. My name is uh, Jason Martin. I'm the lead characters artist over at id Software. Uh, I've been here since two, 2011 and uh, previously uh, for Studio. Nice, man. And just uh, going back to the, the very beginning, I always love talking about this stuff just because um, I always feel like every artist 
has their own journey and like it's always very unique but at the same time there's a lot of commonalities as well but like for you um like how did you get started in art like were you always just gravitated towards that uh, I actually have a pretty unique story, to be honest with you. Um, both of my parents are artists. My mother is an illustrator, and my father was a traditional animator and converted to CG. And uh, I actually had every outlet in the world to have seen an art as a kid. I mean, we had an Oxbury animation camera in our house, but nobody knows what that is. Just look up Oxbury camera, you'll see. Is it but in that building, it's, yeah, no, no, it's just a, it's an old school animation camera. It's just we got two massive poles. In the middle of the camera goes up and down. And we had to build an extension to our house to house it. At the time, mm-hmm. the camera cost more than our entire home did. Uh, this was in the 80s, early yeah. 80s. And uh, so I had, I grew up around Hart, and my father worked for Mount Public Television. So did my mom. That's where they met. And my mom split off and got into motion graphics and stuff when my dad stayed. But uh, so I had a lot of access to access to to do art and stuff like that. And I did art as a kid, but I kind of like rebelled against it or what? I don't know. I was too busy skateboarding and listening to punk rock and stuff when I was younger. <laughs> but um. I do remember in the 90s when I wasn't really going anywhere, doing anything fast out of high school, just kind of hanging out. I was going to college, but not taking anything serious. My dad came home. It's like 95, 96, no, 95, I think. And it was 3D, 3DS, uh, 3D Studio, Mac, it was before it was Max. Yeah. And it was on DOS. And I remember my dad giving me a printout of a tutorial to build like a table. And I remember, you know, trying to, you know, find some other stuff and I was following it. And I remember just like, I could care less about this. <laughs> and, uh, so there was that. And then he even tried again to get me into it by taking me to a Salt Homage demo on an old Silicon Graphics uh, uh, Indigo. One of, one of the very first SGI machines are like $50,000. And uh, I remember demo, sitting through that demo of that. And again, all I could, there was like pastries in the background, like all this like stuff for break. And that's all I cared about. I was like, I can't wait this guy stops talking to <laughs> So it kind of like it's weird. Like I wasn't really connecting to it back then. It just seemed like too technical, or I, I just wasn't motivated. You know, CG something you gotta really want to get into. It's not like it's gonna fall in your lap. So actually, I'll, I'll just jump with that for a second. And say like that. That's like a really critical thing. That like I feel that applies to a lot of things where someone might say, "Hey, you know, you've been doing this for a long time. Just tell me the exact steps of what I got to do to be really successful and everything else." And you you literally could, but it's just not going to resonate if they haven't gone through those paths, those failures, those struggles. It's not going to have that aha moment. And I think for a lot of us, it's kind of like you got to have that discovery on your own. You can't just have someone throw this at you and say, hey, if you do all these things and you're going to be great, it's it's got to be like, all right, well, I got to go and discover that myself and find it and find why uh, I gravitate towards it. You know what I mean? So I think that's kind of like a, a good observation about how you could be given like this really fun, fantastic career. And if it's not the right time, it's just not going to really connect with you. Yep, totally. I mean, I feel like if I don't really know many people in this industry, it just fumbled into it. It was like blood, sweat and tears. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Anyways, my, so my, uh, I, I was afforded all these opportunities, but I was just kind of screwing around with it. And uh, I was from, I'm, I'm from Maryland, like about 30 minutes north of Baltimore. And, I, you know, it's out of country. I just wanted to kind of get away and stuff. So military kind of caught my eye and I jumped into Air Force for a while. And then years later, in my like, late 90s, uh, I started getting in, in, into CG a little bit, you know, started filming around 3D Studio Max, kind of just get my way, Photoshop, you know, scratching the surface kind of, so to speak. Then I started going to college, and then uh, then I started taking it serious, and then I was off the races in the very early 2000s. So That's my cool. dad always likes to bust my balls about it, saying like, "Imagine if you would have uh, <laughs> this, uh, what you know, when I was giving this information to you, because I had so many outlets. Like most people would never have had the opportunity to get all these. This is like back when the day when 3D Studio was still new on PC, and then like uh, going up around animation and stuff like that. It's kind of, I had a lot of opportunities that I kind of yeah. just kind of dismissed this, like took for granted this better better uh Term uh, for it. That's pretty cool because initially, um, you know, I was kind of drafting out like a couple of questions I wanted to talk to you about, and uh, I started reading, you know, what I could online just to get a bit of background as well. And it's kind of funny because initially I'm like, oh yeah, Air Force and all this, and um, you know, and then switching to more of an art career afterwards. And I was like, yeah, this is exactly like my fiance Christina, where uh, she had like a lot of resistance from her parents, especially her dad, just basically saying, you know, get a real job, art isn't a career, blah blah blah. So right. they were both in the military, so. She ended up uh, going and joining the Air Force and 
Um, she's going to be going to weapons tech and, you know, long story short, she couldn't get in because her eyesight and, um, but yeah, like ended up eventually moving into art and I was like, oh yeah, like there's a big commonality there. And then I, I saw like an interview with you, uh, somewhere where you talked about this and I was like, oh, motherfucker, it was actually the other way around. Like your parents were <laughs> ultra supportive and I'm like, all right, I, I want to know more about this now because it seems like, uh, you know, uh, I think he, you mentioned um, that, yeah, your dad came over and installed 3DS DOS. And I was like, man, like, this is all laid out purposely for you. Like, what happened to, like, go this other route and then loop back around? But yeah. again, like, I think it's one of those things that you got to, um, you got to find your path. And, you know, I, I think at the same time, like, I, I will say, like, 95, I was exactly the same. 95 got 3DS DOS and kind of went that route. And, you know, the one thing I do look back at was wishing I had more of a, you know, a childhood, you know, having fun instead of, like, working the whole time. So I think, you got to appreciate that time while you have it i have to agree no, that's cool um yeah i guess like you know fast forwarding for a second to the air force i mean what was that experience like for you and do you think that uh there's a lot of you know maybe a lot of life experiences you took from that that you were able to apply later on or how you oh. know because because I, I will say like some people who've studied music and i found like a lot of correlation with that where um studying music oddly enough is applied um to how they structure their day their work everything they do and same thing with the military there's a lot of people i know who uh do the same thing they're able to take a lot of that discipline those experiences and apply it to everything in their career right no no absolutely i don't regret the military it's the best thing i ever did uh in my life at the time because it did teach me discipline I, I mean i had a ton of jobs as a kid but i never had a real work ethic i kind of screwed off i was being a kid you know mm -hmm. um and uh so the military started catching my eye because I, I really kind of want, I like the idea of moving. I think like at that time, my life had friends starting to like get job, like graduate from college, go to other, or you know, away in college or getting ready to graduate and go, you know, on with their lives. And I just didn't want to be stuck in my town. So I was like, you know what, this is my fast way to get out of here. And uh, when, so once I was in, you know, I thought it was just going to be, you know, four years done, get cut money for college and then kind of figure out what I was going to do. But once, um, once I'm in, once I was in, I actually really actually liked it. I mean, I was a weapons troop, which basically I worked on F-15s, F-16s, on munitions, on uh, bombs and loading bombs and missiles, anything lethal on the aircraft I maintained. Um, so, uh, but uh, so my experience there, I learned you know strong work ethic, a lot of structure, um, and uh, and I, um, I was in NCO. I ended up being in I was in the military for ten years. Uh, it was supposed to be that long, but uh, my um, my uh, separation date was December of 20, uh, uh, 2001, and we all know what happened September 2001. Mm -hmm. So that put stop loss on me, so I couldn't leave or get out. Like I had a uh, my life would if 9/11 happened didn't happen, my life would probably be so different because at that time I was really going to heavily uh, I was going to take I had a really good uh, tattoo apprenticeship lined up near where I grew up, and it was a really good opportunity. But because of 9/11, I couldn't leave or get out. That, that felt through. So um, I was just like, well, okay, I don't know what to do. And then the military kind of came down and said, hey, we have a, um, uh, we you have to decide whether you're going to get in or get out in two weeks. And I had, and they didn't give me any warning. I thought I was going to get like, hey, you're going to, you know, two months from now you can separate. But they gave me two weeks. So I was like, uh. But then they're like, hey, guess what, Jason? We'll send you anywhere in the U.S. and give you this really big reenlistment bonus for four more years. So what I did was I started thinking about that. I went home and thought about it. And I was like, dude, you know what? And they'll send me to any base. Well, they'll try to send me any base that I want to go to. But the cool thing was in the print there was if I didn't like where they were sending me, I could just deny it and get out. Mm -hmm. So I was like, all right, well, I got nothing to lose here. So let's see what happens. So he said, well, we, and I was like, let me try to go to Nellis Air Force Base, which is right outside Las Vegas. This is metropolitan. It, does, it didn't have a, uh, it's a training commitment. So I didn't worry about going to the desert or anything like that. So I was like, that's a lot of colleges, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, I went there and, and uh, basically hunkered down, did my college, and got serious about CG. But all along the way in that whole process of being in the military, I had uh, – this is one of the one things I took at – key thing that I find very surprising is uh, I went through a lot of, like, air, airman leadership school. Uh, there's the NCO training. There's all this stuff, you know, to teach you how to manage and do all these things. And I remember, when, like, later on in my career when I was still taking these courses and stuff like that, I was thinking, man, I'm not going to use any of this stuff in, you know, the real world, you know, like that. But I didn't dismiss it because any, anything I do, I try to do about 110 percent. It's just how I am. So I still, you know, you know, paid attention, listen, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I, I remember thinking, boy, I'm, I'm, I'll keep this under my hat because you never know what, you know, in later on, like what else you're going to do. So just, you know, try to get as much as you can. And uh, when I got out, the funny thing is what I realized is that even in uh, in this industry is that people are people and, you know, they behave the same way. So I, I got a lot out of like how to manage 
get the best out of you guys and manage people and like, you know, and, and, and just a lot of leadership opportunities that actually, quite honestly, I see a lot lacking in this industry. A lot of people just, they don't really teach that stuff sometimes. I mean, people do their best. And I think some people are natural at it and others. But I would say if anything I got out of the, the Air Force is just how to, uh, you know, be a good leader and put you guys first and uh, it, and be a team player. It's not you. It's about everything at the project. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that's the big thing. It's like it's less about the individual and more about team. Yeah, no, I think it's good. And so, like, touching that for one second, like, um, so you, you did take a lot of that the formal kind of training of how to be a leader, and um, you're able to apply it to the work that you do. Like, you're saying that you do kind of wish there was a bit more of that in this industry. And I, I guess that's one thing about uh, video games is that typically it does kind of try and fight the whole corporate feel of you know of structure and and all these other things and. Typically, everyone uh, grows up inside of the hierarchy from being a natural programmer, artist, whatever. And because of that, you don't have like a lot of that leadership training. You don't have the management training. And and a lot of people also rebel from that a little bit, too. But I think that we all need that kind of structure a little bit. Um, I think it's a balance. Like, I don't want to think that like it's like my way, the highway kind of thing. It's no. just, you know, what, honestly, it's more about, ob- in my honest opinion, it's more about observation and working with people. Less about like controlling or like do this or that it's more just like like and like i said I, I really i prefer to be i mean i'm the lead here so yeah i'm in charge of some, my team and stuff like that but it's more of like you know the best idea wins who who out there you know open door policy you support your guys you put them in front of you uh, and if you do that, like, you know, if you take care of uh, the, the ship, the ship will run itself in a, in a, in a, in an odd way. So that's a kind of like to maintain it. I, and I, and I t- basically take, t- I took some of the stuff I learned in the Air Force and can I kind of merged it in, in into my career here in a way that's not so, you know, demanding of like, this has to be this way or that way and stuff like that. It's, it's truly more about an, ob- we always learn this in the military. It's about observation period of like watching and learning and stuff like that. That's basically what I do. Um, it's just like watch and learn about guys and, and, and their strengths will, you know, rise to the occasion. Because like I said, like, I really like doing art. You know, I don't definitely want to be in a position where I'm always just do, managing stuff. I'm, I only have four, we're, we're a four man team here, you know? So it's like, yeah. Really, like I don't, I'm just kind of a point man in a sense. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I, we'll, we'll get into that a bit more in a moment, and I, I think that's so cool. And like you, you went on to VFS, like Vancouver Film School, after that, right? Like, what were you doing there? Yeah, yeah. Like, so I went through like a, like just normal like Joe Schmo like 3D animation program in, in in Las Vegas, and I learned some stuff, but you know, it was just a crash course. Call I mean, it's not. It wasn't anything fancy, and like my work out of there was okay. You know, I had some job opportunities, and actually, that's one of my best things that's not a really good decision i'm glad i stuck out was i struggled with why i would go there at the time in 2005 ish is when um vfs was like hot i mean i was seeing student reels come out of vfs that i was like better i i would i could it's pretty better, awesome like, yeah it was amazing at the time and i mean like i'm talking leaps and bounds behind any other school and i was just kind of like what in the world's going on up there so i started talking to those guys and like i said it was i had graduated from college and i'd done as much as i i was working as hard as i could but my work wasn't anywhere at that level you know so I thought about it. It was not cheap, but I was like, you know what? There, I mean, there was at the time I had like a job leader that they had a local studio in Las, Las Vegas, and it was called Petroglyph. They're gone now, I believe. But I mean, I I was thinking about it, but you know, uh, and, it, and it wasn't like a super solid lead. Someone was basically, you know, it was like a soft thing. But anyhow, mm-hmm. uh, when I saw the VMS stuff, I pulled the trigger on that and went up there, and I'm really glad I did that because I think it made such a huge difference because coming out of VFS. I busted my ass there as far as I could. And at the time, you know, I had done some freelance stuff in between this stuff, but nothing like major. I'm talking rinky dink, like 3D website stuff, some like casino y looking thing, you know, small time jobs. And uh, I went up there and busted my ass. And like, I remember like my dream at the time, I, my one place I always wanted to work at was Blur. And I remember saying, like, it'd be in a class, like, they teach you up there, like, what are your goals, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I want to be, I really want to work as hard as I can. And I guess my, goal would be it'd be pretty sweet if i could get at the time the cg talk was the hot business you know mm-hmm. um if i could get front page cg talk and work up where that's like my wife you know and uh it's it's funny how it all worked out because i mean through a lot of blood sweat and tears that actually all that happened and uh i got the opportunity well it was freelance through blur but i don't i didn't care you know you, yeah. when you're working just a bunch of ranking and stuff and you get a chance a big studio like tim miller emails you and says hey you want to come out here for six months freelance what are you going to do 
So I, I about freaked out about that. That was pretty awesome. That's cool. Tim, uh, it was pretty funny. Like, uh, so I sent my stuff to to I, I held out like when I first got school, and I sent it like before I like carpet bombed the you know the internet, but and the planner where I sent stuff to uh, Blur and uh, just to see if they you know reach out. And I was at like a party on a Friday night, and I got this. Uh, email from like Tim Miller. I'm like, what? You know, like, I didn't, you know, like you said, I didn't think, I didn't think he'd ever email me. And he was basically like, hey man, it's all your work, love it. Which, you know, uh, we have some freelance work for like two pilots, like Warhammer uh, Cinematic at the time and like a Simpsons ride, a, a 3D ride over at Universal. Uh, we have six months, you know, for the work. You know, we, I could like to say maybe you could go into something else, but you know, who knows, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, sweet, yeah. But hey, I have this family vacation. I'll never forget this. This is torture. My parents had a family vacation set up, you know, like they all wanted me to go to. So I basically, you know, said, hey, uh, can I take another week? Can it be like a, a week after that? And uh, so this was like later on day on a Friday at a time. And Tim had got back and he's like, oh, man, that's a bummer. You know, if it's not going to work out, it's fine. We can find somebody else. You know, maybe there would be an opportunity down the road, you know. So I'm not going to blow this over a, a family vacation, right? I'm like, okay, mm-hmm. cool. No, screw it. But it, this was torturing me. So I sent the email back, and he probably left for the day. So I had to suffer <laughs> for, the day for like two days of torture, thinking like, did I just screw up over like a week vacation, you know? But thank God, like Monday, I got an email back from him, and then he passed me off to Tom at the, over there at yeah. the time, and then everything else like lined up, you know? You were like, waiting outside of his house, like, I take it back. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. No, dude. I was so scared. I was like, why did he even say that? You know, like, I didn't think a week was a big deal, but obviously in blur time, that is a big deal. Yeah. Um, so, but it, it, it all worked out. So I'm glad. I had that um, first time ILM ever contacted me. I don't even know how the hell they got my phone number, but this is like 2005 or something. And oh, wow. I, went out for like, I went out for like a blinder of a night the night before. I was back in Australia <laughs> for a little bit. And I, I it was Saturday morning. I was fucked. I was just so – I was still drunk from the night before. And I remember getting a call uh, from Laurie Beck, and she was like, hey, Alan, blah, 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 whole spiel. And she was like, are you interested in, in coming to work for us? And the only word I could drag out of myself was no. <laughs> and I, I had to email her back uh, later and like apologize and like give her the whole spiel. And I don't think I actually got a response at the time. But it was it was just one of these things that like, the, you know, hours later, it's just like, what the fuck are you doing? It's just I could not articulate the words to be like, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I'm just going down this avenue of launching my own company, blah, 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 blah. It's just like, no. And then and then going back to bed, just like fucked so um you know you, you have those moments though it's just like you know complete regret of shit did i blow it and even if um i, I love it now because i mentioned my fiance before but like i i guess I, I i talk about her a bit just because i watch her going through a lot of what i went through as a younger person in my career and she's like looking for work and this and that and so for her especially now with like instant messaging and all that you can read if someone's read a message or whatever so all the time she'll get someone contact her say hey i, w- I want you to do this job and it's like how much money are you going to charge and blah 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 and she'll give her a rate and then they'll read it and not respond and she'll be like he read it he didn't respond like did i go too high did i go too low and like you, all the shit that goes through your head and then oh for goodness. all you know they might be just taking a shit like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. it's like you, you just put yourself in this mental anguish man like oh my yeah. gosh i still remember that oh, it's the worst. <laughs> so um what was it like when you finally went over there oh man dude was it what you expected Oh, it was crazy. Like, I, I you mentioned, like, Blur, I mean, when you worked a couple of small time freelance jobs, blah, 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 and you come out of school, and I've, I've always been like, I was hardcore, uh, like, into it. When I was like, I worked my ass off. I was kind of like made for Blur at that time, you know? I'm, like, lifestyle is like, was what I was living at school, you know? But when I went in there, I'll never forget this, dude. They gave me this ridiculous, like, prop, like, this for Warhammer. It was like this, uh, like, a mace with all this stuff and engraving on it. And, <laughs> And they told me, they're like, yeah, you have uh, two days to make this, like, complete, like, one day model, one day texture. And I was, just, I remember standing at the computer, and I'm like, well, I'm going to be fired. Um, <laughs> and I'm, I'm, in, I'm not even going to make it a week. But then I, I came back to the producer, and I was like, I think I can do it in, like, a, you know, a week. You can give me five days, I can model it and have it all, whatever. And I busted my ass, and I kind of got it done. And, I mean, it didn't, like, it was funny, because Jed at the time did come over and realize, like, we did kind of underbid this. It was a little, mm. <laughs> this a little bit unrealistic, say, two days more of a five day thing but i mean i ate bread and slept it but uh the whole week i was there basically but the really cool thing about Blur, what i loved is i would have been fucked if it wasn't for the guys around me like like james Koo was there at the time and he kind of like yeah it's just a senior artist at the time there he kind of put me under his wing and showed me some stuff make me you know what i mean make my life a lot easier so that was the best thing about there is like 
uh, is just everybody being so willing to teach you and show you stuff. Like there was no real like, attitude. Or I love that Tim protected that place in that sense. It was just, I mean, you know, like the bullshit didn't exist there. Uh, and we all, I mean, worked hard and busted your ass, blah blah blah. But it was very much like I don't know. The environment there was a the shit, and uh, that's the, that was the, one of the best things I always cherish about uh, the blur. But it was like being thrown in the deep end, man, dude. Holy hell! It was something. Yeah. But I think it's one of the strengths is like the fact that you you are going somewhere that is going to you know you're you're going to sink or swim and when when you know at least for me it's always been like every project you you kind of have a little bit of that feeling of all right like I'm going to have to like raise the bar again this week just like yeah. every other freaking week so um it's good though it pushes you rather than like I, I remember there's one place I worked uh, I was in Vancouver around 2009 2010 and I was working at a game studio and it got to a point where where I was just so bored of my job. I wanted to see, like, can I go two weeks without doing a single bit of work and like see if anyone even freaking notices? And uh, we we had just published an, a game, so it was a bit more chill. But it's just kind of like if you get to that point where you're just that unsatisfied with what you do, then you you want that growth. It's kind of like if um, if you don't have any discipline, you kind of start acting out, wanting someone to punish you because right. you know you you need that discipline. You need to to see that people care and when you are at a place that is literally expecting every single time, it's like, all right, like we, we wanted to give 110% last week and you did it. So we think that you've really got 120% in you. So let's, let's do it again. Um, and yeah, I, I think it's good. It's going to always make you uh, feel challenged. And that's, that's an important part of like what we all do. Yeah. Plus, you know, there it's like, I was also new to a studio like that. And there's just such an infinite amount of talent in that building that I mean, I, I, you, I felt about as big as a speck of dust, you know? So I, I just, I mean, I was that blur for five years and plus a bunch of freelance time too after that. But um, I just basically was like a, a sponge as much as I could. I just kind of shut up and paid attention as much as possible. You know what I mean? Like, um, try to get as much out of it as possible in the first couple of years there, you know, it was definitely like boot camp. I get, it's funny because uh, yeah, you're not the first person to refer to it as boot camp. Um, so I guess like just touching base on Blur for a second, like what was your favorite or most challenging project there, or or character if if more specifically? Oh man, dude, there's a couple. Probably the coolest thing I got to do there was work on Darth Vader for the Force Unleashed cinematic, just because it's Star Wars, it's Darth Vader. How can I kind of mm-hmm. get there? You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, but it, it wasn't the most challenging, but it was definitely one of the most all oh, cool moments. You know what I mean? I had a couple of them. And another nerdy moment I had there was I did the Joker for uh, our, uh, um, Arkham, Batman, Arkham, uh, the Rock City guys. And yeah. uh, uh, it's Arkham City, I believe, cinematic. But anyways, uh, Mark Hamill, he didn't speak at all. And he just laughed. But to me, that was another nerdish, you know, like, holy God, I got to make a character that was voiced by, you know, like Mark Hamill. That was pretty cool. Yeah. Um, challenging wise, man, there was just so many. I think one of the toughest ones actually was, this is a classic where, you know, I did this massive dragon for Dragon Age, and the shots always kept changing. And like, you have to build this one massive asset that holds up across the board. It was, it was just like so impossible. And then you just see a shot of like, there's a character and a whole arm comes down behind him. Like the size of it is just ridiculous. And I was like, mm-hmm. so, just trying to cover like all your textures. It was just torture, man. I was in there like, oh my gosh, it was, it was a, it was a nightmare. It came out pretty good. And yeah, yeah it looked great. And uh, the, the, uh, of course, I've seen some of the guys always do some magic to this close-up shot to the top of your model and kind of give a little more fidelity. But uh, that, that probably kicked my ass pretty bad. Um, <laughs> but uh, there's just so many. I mean, oh, my gosh. I felt like, like you, were just, you said something a minute ago. It's like every time, every every model I've ever done just about in this industry, it's funny. Like, you go to sit down and do it, and I wonder if it's the same effects in other areas. It's like you play it, you look at it, and you're like, okay, this part will be easy, this part will be easy, this part will be blah, 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 get it. Almost without fail, almost every time model I do that to, it's always the part that I thought was going to be hard is easy, and an easy part throws me a, a loop. Like, like yep. it's way more difficult. I'm like, what the hell, dude? Like, <laughs> But every time, it's always some challenge. I don't think, I mean, once in a while you get something that comes across, you just kind of get it in and out. It goes across your desk, you know, it's pretty straightforward. But uh, and more so nowadays, but in the, it, I still get plenty of stuff that comes across my desk. That's, that I'm like, it, you're always learning, man. Like, I don't care how long you've been doing it. I still get something that kicks my ass. 
Absolutely. Uh, I mean, I think this is like the number one rule for me when I'm bidding projects is like, you know, you you bid it all out, you figure it all out, then it's like, well, it's 3D, shit's going to go wrong, so let's just tack on a few more days because like <laughs> yeah. it is. It's always like oh, I didn't anticipate that this one little thing could end up, you know, taking longer than everything else, and it's always the case. Yeah, it's so weird. I mean, yeah, exactly. And Murphy's law, man. If it's going to go wrong, it's going <laughs> to. So, um, I guess like when it's time to transition to id, like how did that all come to be? Oh, actually, like, well, that's pretty cool because one of the sad things, man, I love Blur and I, I feel like I, I got to be tarp. I think Blur has always had different eras, you know, like there was the first one before they off on Abbott Kinney and then they moved in the new building and then, uh, uh, a lot of mixed feelings when everyone moved to Culver City. Yeah. It, at, at least in the beginning. Yeah. It's weird to me, man. Like I, I think of Blur right now, like in my head, it's the old building and they're still moving around there. Even though I've been to the new building several times now, it's like, when I think of it, it's, they're still in that old building. Yeah. Um, but so, like, as much I, I really, really, I would have stayed at Florida as long as I could. But I had a child, and uh, LA became you know, expensive, so I just drove around. But it's, <laughs> I want to be there for my kid. <laughs> yeah. But it's a two fold. Was a two fold problem. I saw the writing on the wall in a lot of ways because what ended up happening was at Florida when we used to do cinematics and get all these few characters, we used to redo them, start from scratch, or get a concept and build them all the way up. And towards like I started seeing around two thousand eight ish, two thousand nine ish. We started getting assets from game studios that were like ZBrush models that were awesome. Like, you know, they weren't rough or not done or anything like that. Like, I'm like, oh my God, we got to read it. And it was from AAA studios. So I got to the point in my la- my first half of where everything was well, cool, you know, I could view on anything. But my last half, I tried to d- duck and weave AAA projects because I knew those assets were more cleanup. I didn't get the artistic stuff was more like you, you assembly line put stuff together, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, not all projects are like this. But anyways, the moral of the story is when I started seeing that, I was like, you know what? I feel like games is going to be – I feel like games is not that far away from – in a couple of years, will be far away from the characters I'm making at Blur. Uh, I think this is a good time to look around. Plus, the child, you know, in L.A. And honestly, uh, it was kind of like Jeremy Cook and Tim Wallace were it. Uh, both yeah. ex – I mean, beginning Blur guys, you know? And uh, they needed people out here. And I didn't think I'd ever move to Dallas. But then Jeremy got a hold of me on the phone. And I came out here for an interview. And, you know, uh, that was that. I was sold because of the home housing prices and, like, what I could provide my family and everything out here just, just made sense, you know. But uh, leaving Blur was hard, man. I, I mean, I still have so much love for that studio, even though it's been through what I just I love that they're still around and still going, even they're surviving and transitioning because, you know, everything changes and that the market changes um, and the success with the films and Deadpool and Tim and all that stuff. So uh, I'm always pulling for him. But it was hard to leave. Uh, I mean, I, 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 I always have heart for that place. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, it's definitely it's gone through, I feel like, so many more cycles than most other studios. You know what I mean? And, and like for you, like going on specifically to it, like was that directly onto the original uh, Doom project? Uh, yeah. So like uh, it went through some. It's interesting. Like when I came here to work with Jeremy, uh, there was two two teams. There was Rage. There was the Doom team here, and then we were going to build. A, we were going to be start a new project, uh, which you know. I can't speak of what it was at the time, but where's the new team? And I was working for Marty Stratton and, and Jeremy Cook's our director. And, uh, and uh, it was just this, this small group of us, maybe like 20, you know, doing art and programming and everything. And uh, we were kind of assisting out like uh, Doom at the time. And, uh, and so when I came here, I got slid into that slot and everything. But then it kind of came into a weird phase where like Rage came out. And then uh, basically it was, uh, this is happens a lot of studios is there's always problem with rapid growth. And that's kind of what basically happened. The studios grew, mm-hmm. grew really, really fast. And, um, uh, and they basically, like, cause I'm ex a parent company kind of looked at the situation after, you know, he's like, maybe this happened too quick kind of deal and consolidated everybody down. And, um, and uh, so they put us in one team and stuff like that. And then uh, that's when we were focusing on doom and, and whatnot. And then the studio went through some turmoil, some people left and, you know, whatever. And then we were kind of left with, it kind of worked out though, because like when people leave in and whatnot, and, and that's really still usually good for a studio. If people have a lot of animosity or anger or frustrated or blah, blah, blah. When you have three teams version of one, you can imagine you're going to have some people. Left. Mm-hmm. So yeah. naturally people, you know, you know, my time in this, this, you know, this position's done, I'll move on, blah, blah, blah. And it frees up time for more people to come in. And, uh, and it gave us some time to really like, kind of focus on what we wanted to do. And, um, and we kind of hunkered down into uh, a smaller team and figure out what we want to do and then kind of slowly rebuilt uh, the studio into what it is now. And now it's, you know, uh, you know, fresh, 
you know, fresh eyes, fresh perspective. Uh, and then Hugo came out and uh, that you've worked for year, close friends with Hugo for years of, when we worked together at Blur. And then we kind of just started rebuilding the studio slowly. And uh, it basically became the genesis of what Doom 2016, you know, that's basically birthed that. Uh, now that, that presented its own, you know, wealth of challenges involved in that whole process, just with getting new people in, new tech, new everything. And it was kind of like changing out a car engine when it goes around a track. Uh, but somehow we pulled it off through brute force and a lot of long hours. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it sprinkled with some very smart decisions, too. I mean, I'm not going to sit there and say it was just all luck, but I think we made right. some really good calls along the way to kind of, it kind of propelled us, you know, uh, through. So that's basically my my quick version of like my transition into to, to, to its game side of things. And there was definitely some interesting things to learn along the way, too. You know, a lot of people get, get like, there's games and there's film, you know, like they both had their. It, different sets of challenges they're both different but mm-hmm. just anybody anybody in my opinion can do both especially nowadays but it's just a matter of like learning a specific skill set you know but if you have the time you can do it kind of deal you know uh yeah no that's awesome like um i don't know like I, part of me really wants to dive into it but i feel like it's one of those more um you know one-on-one conversations for for a beer i guess but um were you original like originally a big fan of uh the original doom yeah, uh, I mean, that, the, this, I gotta pinch myself every once in a while, you know. I mean, I remember playing Doom '94 ish. Mm-hmm. I think it was right after graduating high school. My friend's dad, my friend's dad just got it. I remember my friends like, man, dad just got a brand new Pentium Gateway, dude. And nice. uh, there's this game Doom you gotta see, and uh, and so I'm like, okay, cool, went over there, and you know, his parents were religious. And so we had to like mm-hmm. duck and weave in the bottom of his dad's kitchen business while he loaded this game up. And I remember seeing that was the first time I saw Doom. And of course, you know, everyone, these pentagrams, blood, beam, and they're just, yep. just bananas, you know? It's like nothing you ever seen before. So if you could go back in time and tell me that I would re- get to work on reimagining some of those monsters and demons and, and creatures, it's pretty crazy to even fathom, considering back then I, you know, I only knew my little area in Maryland. I'd never been out it yeah. a handful of times, you know? So it, it was quite the, the, the opportunity, and uh, I was really stoked to to, to to get the you know. I'm glad we went back to the roots of what Doom was. You know, I like all versions of Doom, but there was definitely at the studio at the time there was looking like we're going to do, uh, you know, like more Doom three, go back, you know, blah blah blah, and like everybody, a lot of the people in the studio love all versions of Doom, so it was kind of like which way are we going to go. But I'm so mm-hmm. happy we, I think, settling on the way we did, basically going back to more of its roots. And there's still plenty of like throwbacks to Doom and three stuff in our in our our iteration to Doom. But I'm glad yeah. we went back to its roots as close as possible. But yeah, I think it's the it's the nostalgia as well. Like yeah. for for a lot of us, it's like um, <clears throat> yeah, I you know I was obsessed with it. like it, it. Kind of is what got me. You know, most people talk about Star Wars and Jurassic Park. What which which was the one that got you in here? And um, for me, like it was. I had a 286. I've mentioned this a few times because I've been talking to Virginia and Hugo, but like I had a 286 and then I wanted to play Doom and I couldn't. So I started replacing all the game art in Wolfenstein, which would run on a 286 with all the Doom stuff. So like <laughs> bit by bit, I was just like um, obsessing about it enough. Like I wanted to recreate that world. 286, you know, man. Well, I got ripped off. I, I went to my uncle and he's like, oh, like someone I know was trying to sell his 386, um, you know, for 500 bucks. And I, I sold all my artwork. I was doing a lot of illustration stuff. I, I was young, like 10, I think 11. Uh-huh. And yeah, I'd sell all my artwork. I hustled and I got $500 together, got the 386. And the one thing I wanted to do besides like trying to do some like pixel, uh, pixel art on it with the Lux Paint was um, was yeah play doom and then i was in denial even though i kept saying 286 on the screen i'm like no it's a 386 <laughs> uh until I, I installed doom and uh and that's when it was like you need a x80 386 sx processor at least to run this and i'm like okay if doom says i have a three if i it says i have 286 then you know i believe doom or anything else <laughs> yeah i remember my but, friend that same my same friend i never forget this i laugh about it all the time he had a 386 and we had issues on that point of Pentium to run it. I remember, yeah, I remember that thing had an 80 meg hard drive. I remember he was like, "How will we ever fill this up? It's so much space." Yep, yep. <laughs> 80 meg. Yeah, I, I, I had 20 meg. I had to like uninstall shit every freaking time, and then. <laughs> 
I remember getting a 256 megabyte drive and being like, I will never run out of space. <laughs> yes. And uh, here I am now with like terabytes all, all in boxes right now, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's it's insane. But um, it's also insane just to kind of see how rapidly, you know, things change. Like in the last 20, 30 years, like how many times like things have iteratively like outdone itself, you know, and where we are. So, I mean, yeah, it's mind blowing. I mean, game cinematics back in the day, like Command and Conquer and all those ones that we'd watch, like X-Wing or whatever. And you know, you look at that now and like if a video game looked like that, you'd puke, you know, so it's it's so crazy how your mind remembers those things. Like, mm. it's just nuts. I mean, I remember years ago doing that thing going on Nostalgia Road. And it's like, I almost wish I didn't do it. I remember looking at game cinematics like, no way. I mean, I, like, <laughs> you remember them so much different than they actually looked like. Yeah, don't don't ever watch Warcraft two ever again. It'll ruin your childhood. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, did, I did. I watched those. Even the original Starcraft cinematics. Even what yep. people don't realize is like there's such a large leap. Real quick, if people if Starcraft two cinematics came out, blah blah, and then there's Warcraft three. There wasn't a bunch of years of time in between those two. But if you look at the Warcraft three with Brazil rendering compared to Starcraft two cinematic, that is a yep. massive, massive leap in just several years. Uh, of of uh, of time in that, that in that era of game cinematics, like Blizzard really like jumped in. Blizzard and Blur felt they jumped in. Warcraft three, like at the time that was the pinnacle you know of, of what you could do with cg and like that's the thing there was always like the max maya debate and all that kind of shit and i feel like just saying like check out warcraft 3 you know like that they could have gone like you looked at final fantasy which was out roughly around the same time the, the movie um and i mean warcraft 3 i mean obviously it's it's not feature length but yeah it looks even more beautiful than that like it, it was amazing what those guys were doing you know it's, at a small studio it's still whole, i mean if you look at that whole scene of work after cinematics work after three with arthas walking out with the rose and everything yep. like that that still looks pretty you know i mean it's dated but i mean like you know and if you go like a couple years before that with a starcraft 2 cinematics like when <laughs> or like brazil rendering and all that stuff came was out it was just bananas yeah I, I have to agree it was just like it's 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 you know i, I see that stuff's all dated and stuff now of course but uh it's still like it, it, it ages better than i thought it did yeah so, no absolutely back. so i guess um you know being a big fan of doom like did you feel a big weight on your shoulders to not fuck it up when <laughs> yeah. it came to uh yeah yeah that, that absolutely i mean it's tough you know like i kind of I, i'm luckily enough that i don't that this stuff suck me out too much you know sometimes it does get to you a little bit but like we had to reimagine these characters and we well, then because of that we went through tons of iteration of these things like there was just like we worked characters to death to the point where i was like seeing cross-eyed sometimes like i didn't know that this is good looking good anymore but it's because we cared so much i mean it's so hard to nail that you're like you know you try to like you, it, it, reimagining that stuff is like how do you keep this nostalgic how do you you know because before doom 2016 came out if you ask them what, what people wanted from doom ever you couldn't please them all you know what i mean it's just kind of like we got to like pick a route and go with it and like stick and just go with what we think as a studio we want to do and what the fans will like you know but it was definitely challenging and there's a lot of time went into a lot of those characters it wasn't like i mean sketch after sketch i mean we remodel some some a lot you know just because you know, we're really, really anal about it. I mean, demons and weapons are kind of the star of Doom, so we got kind of got to get that right. It's the it's worth the extra effort there, you know. I mean, it's it's just it is what it is, but uh, mm. it, it was definitely challenging, but awesome, you know. I mean, I, I love the fact. I mean, I, this is like a in my opinion, anybody likes map modeling like creatures like that. I don't know of a better studio to work for. You get you get to do hard surface and organic and monsters and they're weird and they're crazy. Man, look at the Revenant. He's basically like a crazy skin human skeleton with rockets on his back. I mean, it's just nutty stuff like that. That's why I like working on this this title because we can just make ridiculous things and it's a lot of fun. Yeah, I was saying to Hugo, like, uh, I was actually referencing Dave Stinnett, saying I'm, I'm not Dave Stinnett in the, in the sense that my desk isn't just covered in toys. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, like, Doom was, like, the one thing that I would totally nerd out and, like, buy all the creature maquettes if there were any around. But Because, yeah, I'd love a freaking Hell Knight or Cyber Demon sitting on my desk or whatever, like, just for a bit of inspiration or, or something to look at occasionally while you work. Oh, yeah. That, that's actually how the one thing that Hugo always said while we worked and I, I, for the characters that I thought stood really true. It was a really good like pillar to hit on characters. It was just like, do we want this as a maquette sitting on our desk? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And like that actually became kind of like a bullet point for when we're designing our characters. It's like, it's got to feel like it's got to have like the, you know, I mean, plus we're all from that, that era anyway. Like it's got to have that eighties or early nineties feel. And like, you, you definitely, like, I love the idea of a toy sitting on my desk. So when you think about a character, like, would you want this yep. toy sitting on your desk pose? And that's a good like gateway for, you know, for just a good, this is just a yeah. good check mark 
to check off on a character creation side of things, in my opinion. No, absolutely. And typically when you start out on a character, like how do you start all the way to how do you finish? Um, well, so what we usually do is like we're, we're, we're more of a traditional studio in house and, and sort of concept. Because we, like, we like a lot of get a lot of thumbnails, rough ideas and ideation for concept guys. And then uh, the cool thing is just like I have a very strong you know character team. It's me, Denzel Neal. Senior, who's a senior, Brian Wine is a senior, and then Emmanuel Pilot, who's a junior. But um, all of my guys are really good at being able to take loose ideas and 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 kind of fussing them or filling in the blanks and stuff like that. Some monsters, obviously, we went through more iterations. Some they wanted to see, you know, we'll bust out a proxy real quick, kind of throw a quick rig on it, look at it, see how it looks, and then we'll move into more proportional side of things where we want to kind of get it solidified for a rig and then moving forward. Um, and, uh, we usually bust that stuff out and see bush really quickly. Uh, and then it gives the animators time to play around and kind of see what things look like and, and get some temp stuff on the, on the characters in a rough state where usually with proper planning, we're not expecting, you know, the character to grow a third arm or something like that, you know? So we're, we feel right. pretty safe just cruising that a path of creating a character while animations, you know, playing around with some stuff with a proxy rig that usually informs some other things that sometimes it'll change, you know, some aspect of the design. will be like, Hey, this isn't working. We got to work around this and whatnot. And, um, I mean, we got, uh, Ben Durkin, who was a regular blur just started here in January. So, uh, uh, he, he's been helping out a lot with, um, uh, with, our, with the whole rigging pipeline and whatnot. And uh, I have a great working history because I worked with him for years at, at, at Google. Mm-hmm. And I think he was working at NVIDIA prior to here, I think. I'm not sure. Um, but, uh, but yeah, once we get through the proxy stage of, and we're continuing along the high poly uh, it, with NZ Brush, poly modeling both back and forth, really. Uh, I, I never, I feel like I'm, sometimes I do hard service NZ Brush. A lot of times, I, I'm more I'm more on the polygon kick right now, just because of the control aspect of things. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, then we just take it the rest of the way, you know. Uh, everything else is pretty straightforward. I mean, kind of moves to Substance Painter this year. That's only really new, you know. It's nothing really universally has changed in a while, besides adding that into our pipeline. Uh, Kaufman got me onto the the Substance Painter kick as well. Yeah. So. It, it's pretty yeah. awesome. I, I, I mean, I, I, I love it so far. There's some things that aggravate me about it, but like that's what every new software coming in, you know, it's, it's, it has so much potential, in my opinion. It's weird getting letting go of your PSDs, though. It freaks me out. Like, it's just weird. <laughs> and I, I don't have like a PSD. I knew it. It's just something feels wrong about that. <laughs> like, I just can't explain it. It's just... you grow up with that. Yeah. Um, and I, I guess, like, sorry, I'll, we'll continue the, the character path. But, like, what tools typically are you using at the moment? Because I know Moto was kind of um, one of the go tos there for some team members as well, right? Yeah, yeah. Moto's a big one around here. The funny thing is, is uh, with ZBrush is my main go to, uh, of course. I still, polygon, polygon, polygon modeling wise, <laughs> I can't talk. Um, I am still using exercise dead bloated corpse at the moment. Um, <laughs> but I'm going to, I have to shift eventually. Like, I kind of, Blur got me involved in a weird, because I grew, I cut my teeth on Max, so I know Max too, but I don't like poly modeling in it. I, I can, but I'm just faster at exercise. So, but I know, I use Max for rendering and all kinds of stuff. We have Max here also. Um, but so I use kind of, kind of tag team exercise max back and forth, but, uh, I, I do need to like, I want to streamline my whole modeling pipeline split like that. So I, I might be either shifting to Maya and Moto. I, I imagine my modeling aspect, I'll probably just, you know, stick with Moto and, or, yeah, I don't know. We'll see. But I mean, I think that is the natural, if I, if everybody I talk to that used to use XSI, you know, they all, most of them migrated by, if, if they had the choice to, to Moto. And we have a lot of people here that still use Moto. I mean, if we actually, the students have used Moto for a long time in the environment side of things and world building. So, I mean, I guess it kind of would make sense that I would go over there. I just got to find the time. That's the issue. It's just getting up on new software. It's not like it's yeah. hard. It's just, you just go from being in a race car to a Volkswagen for a while. You know, um, uh, but I just got to find the time to do it. I actually look forward to it because I, because I feel like even all my polygon modeling stuff in XSI, I, I use it's just super simple things. It's like cut, you know, bevel, chop, chopping edges, and you know, it's I don't need much. And I feel like there's there's been some advances on modeling that I can improve my, but just make my life a little bit faster instead of like brute force, you know, doing things. So um, that that's Moto probably 
I don't know. I can't make up my mind. I gotta pick up some. I gotta pick something and just stick with it here soon. Yeah, just pick one. God damn it. Um, like, no, yeah, I know what you mean though. Like it's it's kind of t- difficult when every package has its own workflow and they all kind of have their advantages and disadvantages. Um, yeah, I, I guess like because I I know um, I gotta be respectful of your time, so I'm trying to dot through this pretty quickly. But like, um, there is like so much stuff that I do want to kind of pick your brain about. But I guess just talking about more of the passion side of things. I mean, what was your favorite character of the original Doom before you actually got had uh, any development experience on Doom? Oh man, like oh that's tough. It would probably <laughs> have been. I mean, I don't know. Hell Knights were pretty rad. Uh, Hell Knights, I don't know. Pain Elemental, gosh, I don't know. It's tough. Cagney, Cag- I, I would probably say design wise, just pop that just jumps out at me when I think of Doom's probably Cacodemon. Big old red, yeah. blue blooded Cacodemon. Probably. What's the way he dies is just freaking amazing. Yeah, you yeah, know. It's easily the same. And the sounds of Doom, man. Like, this, I just love the <laughs> <laughs> all. You know? Yeah. That, that, it probably jumps out at me the most. Um, That's cool. Yeah, like the probably 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 Cacodemon, you might have to say. Yeah, I I like the transitions like to the new one. Like you know, every character went through a lot of cosmetic changes, but uh, Cacodemon kind of definitely had the feel of like, yeah, you 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 don't. A lot of the other characters for a second, you're like, all right, what what the hell are you? And then with the Cacodemon, it's like ah, that's a fucking Cacodemon. Like, <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I want to kill it and see if it dies the same way as it used to. You know, um, that's cool. Like, what about like working on characters? Like, what was your favorite one to develop? Oh man, that's tough. I mean, I. I... Man, I don't know. I gotta say, I guess probably the Doom Marine was probably the most favorite to work on. If not that, I would say uh, the uh, Revenant, just because he's so crazy. He's just like a yeah. skin with rocket packets on. You know, it's just so bizarre. That's what I mentioned earlier. I mean, at this, when, you, when it comes to Doom, you can just be anything. You know, I mean, well, be anything with with some limitations, but it's about skirting the line of like uh, of campiness, but then pulling back just enough. You know. Like finding your finding your walls there and pulling back, but definitely probably the revenant, revenant and doom rain uh, mm-hmm. were probably my favorite store on. But uh, as far as creature wise, the revenant would be my probably my favorite. That's cool. And did you get to work with a lot of the original uh, id team, like those who are still there? Yeah, I did. Like, well, uh, some of the guys, a lot of them I had left, but I mean, I worked with Kevin Cloud a lot. I mean, he's one of the original members of Doom. Kevin's great. I, lo- I love working around with him. Also, uh, I didn't get to work with Carmack very long, but I thought it was pretty cool. Like, you know, when you first get here and come to it, it's like oh, John Carmack, you know, but John Carmack isn't like a small talk kind of guy. You don't like just run down his office like, hey, you know, she's just mm. that's not how John Carmack is. He's kind of like accused to himself and he's not much of a small talker or anything. So I always kept my distance from him. I didn't want to be that annoying guy, you know. I just wait and talk to him in the hallway and blah, blah, blah. But we, and he was always involved in a bunch of different stuff since he's been here. I mean, there's the engine, there's the space flight stuff, like the Oculus at the beginning of what was the, the, the Oculus stuff, um, and VR. But uh, he, we had some issues with the engine. And at it, one day, it's so funny, like, I come to work and I look behind the, the, the character team and John Cormick just set his desk up behind us. And it was like, super weird. <laughs> like you know you know kind of like being like play around and do for office like that but like you know oh man so it went from like being like everybody talking to everyone just like being like just quiet and working for like a week and then um he didn't you know, know how to take it but he was basically he's like i'll come down there like his solution was i would just come out there and work with the team and and fix you know whatever i'll jump in where i can where i'm doing other stuff so his whole his whole thing was i'm gonna be down there working where i basically see a problem i'll assist um, kind of deal. And like one day we were just talking about stuff and then John just spun around his chair and kind of Carmack started talking to us and it definitely took a lot of air out of the room and we had, uh, it was pretty cool for a couple of weeks that so was basically, it was before PBR, we weren't into a full conversion. I mean, everybody else was moving on it but at the time we were looking at release dates and stuff and we were, at, the, at this point we couldn't afford to do a full rewrite kind of deal so we had too many, uh, too many wheels in motion so we were doing like what can we do to make our specular behave a little better with, with that in our power, which is like loss at the time. That's what they refer to right here. It's a weird term. Um, and anyhow, uh, so I got to work with John for a little bit, for a couple, maybe two weeks, trying to get our specular stuff just right. And that was kind of weird, too, because there's sometimes where he made some changes where I didn't really agree with. So it was a weird moment where I'm like sitting at my desk and he's turned around and I'm like, I don't, I don't think this is right, but I don't want to say he's wrong. Like <laughs> from an artist standpoint, not like mathematically, I got no business. I got no dog in that fight like, at all. But for an art reason, I was like, man, this doesn't really work. But um, 
it was pretty cool when I explained it. I, I basically, I was like, well, I got to talk to the guy. I wouldn't mean, come on. Like, it's silly for me to just sit there and not do say anything. So I was basically, hey, John, like from an artist standpoint, can, what can we do to get this behave this way, which makes more sense to the artist? And once I showed it to him, he was just like, oh, yeah, it totally makes sense. We should do this, you know. Um, uh, basically, we were worried about like the exponential specular curve. It was like, you know, hot, hot. It was just, there's a weird curve to it. We we're kind of trying to adjust to make sure we had more all the range, so we weren't clamped down to this one little area. You know. Yeah, you didn't get any blowouts. Or yeah, exactly. That's that's what basically we were kind of like fudging. We, we could, like I said, PBR is a lot more straightforward nowadays. But then we had to like let's see how we can move these numbers around to kind of get things right. So it was cool to get to work with him for a little bit. Uh, soon after that, he he, he left. He, he he moved on to other things, but. Uh, that was pretty cool. I gotta say, I got you know, and he's a gaming legend, and um, mm-hmm. it was pretty, pretty cool. That he just came down and sat with us for a couple of weeks, and you know, got to work with him on those things. So that was a cool little feather to put in the cap. No, it's cool. That's really awesome. Um, yeah, and like, how do you feel the place has changed over the years since you've been there? Actually, a lot in culture wise. Like I said, like it, it's like I don't really, but this is gonna happen anywhere, in my opinion. When you jam three teams together, and it, it was traditionally really small. I mean, I think I think shipped Doom three with under thirty people. You know what I mean? Like that's crazy. That's two thousand four. Times have changed since then, obviously. But anyways, mm-hmm. over the years, when you expand out like that, and it's, this I came around twenty eleven. So you know that was two thousand four. Six years, they went from thirty people to two hundred some. I think they had a mobile division, wow. and then when everything kind of like got a little haywire, basically what happens is when you grow a team like that. The, the product started getting, there were some issues with the product. You know what I mean? Like things were kind of getting lost in the weeds. So everyone like they, ZeniMax is a great parent company, in my opinion, kind of let, like they didn't get too involved. They kind of let us figure it all out. But the one thing they did, basically, we shifted back down to one team. And like I said, three teams come together. People are going to get frustrated and leave or whatnot. But uh, I watched the studio go from a tense environment like that. Because there's some bad press about it. I'm not going to sit there and like wave my hand over Anybody can Google uh, Doom in, the, mm-hmm. in that area. I mean, uh, it's software in that area, and you're going to see a lot of bad press about it. So what we did is just hunker down and let, us, let people go. We let's started getting a game plan we're going to do, and then rebuilt and slowly rehired. And this is also when Hugo came out here, and we loved how blurred was so much. We tried to take our time and just hire people with the right personalities and uh, growth. And plus, another cool thing in this situation is when you have a lot of people here like that, a lot of people would have left. It let a lot of the people get up into positions that at the time before people would think, oh, they're not good enough or they don't have the skill set for these positions. It let people, you know, expand out into those roles and, and, and really push themselves. And we found a lot of like talent that we just didn't know we had in a lot of ways. Wow. Um, and that really kind of evolved. And we just t- we hired slowly and not rapidly. You know, we learned our lesson from the, the rapid buildup. Uh, that happened prior to me being here, but I was kind of tail end of things. And I've watched this grow from from a really ter- like rough period where people were very un- uncertainty to us getting together in a ship and doom and then watching this, the, you know, the success and fan reaction to that. And, uh, and so I've watched it kind of like go from, you know, uh, go, go, you know, a really rough bad spot into a cocoon phase and then out emerged, you know, a, a, a beautiful butterfly. Beautiful butterfly, exactly. <laughs> uh, That's awesome. And, and no, it's, it's really cool. And I, I'm really happy with the team here. And um, and the cool thing is, too, is like, uh, I remember people that left in that era, and I mean, I stayed in contact with a lot of those guys. And they're, you know, they're doing great new jobs now, and no harm, no foul. It's just kind of the natural order of things. But uh, it, I'm glad I stuck it out. You know, it was definitely rough. I mean, in the early days, I I mean, I would have been crazy not to when I went through that one real rough spot. I mean, I, I thought about, like, you know, should I leave, blah, blah, blah. I stuck it out because I was new to games, and I could just, you know, I still like the title and IP, and I like the area. So I was like, you know what, dude, I'm going to dig in and ride this, you know, if it, you know, I'll ride this wave and hopefully, you know, you know come out. And it did. So it's been really cool watching this, this place uh, morph into what it's become. That's so cool, man. Like, I got one or two more questions and we'll start to wrap things up. But, like, just talking more about, um, I guess, taking what you talked about earlier about leadership and a lot of what you were taking from the Air Force. And also, uh, Hugo talked a lot about, too, like what you guys typically seek in artists having, you know, solid soft skills and hard skills rather than being like, all right, they're a great, really great artist, but they're a dick, you yes, know, and can't yes. communicate with the team. Soft like, skills what do you... are so important to us. <laughs> Yeah, like what do you? Uh, well, actually, do you want to describe that really quick for anyone? Yeah, yeah. Soft skills is just interaction with the team and like how well you can communicate with everybody else. Like, are you a dick? Are you an asshole? You know, we want you passionate, but we want you to be able to work with everybody else, and we want you to, you know, be able to be part of the team. Like, it's very less I, more we. And like, mm-hmm. you know, can you can you like let an idea? Can an intern come in and come up to you with an idea, and you pass that idea forward instead of being like, 
man, that's better than my idea and to kind of stifle that. Like, no, no, like, you know, like a lot of people at times, I understand that fear that, and Rob's in the period to like, kind of protect yourself kind of deal. But like, if you just let those people shine, they'll take care of you in a little while. That's how I, I tell that I roll, roll with that. But that's just one example of soft skills. Mostly it's just getting along with the team. Uh, can you, can you communicate? Can you keep your head on straight? You know, you know, can you work out problems? Uh, you know, or, you know, or you don't become the cancer. Don't become negative. Try to like, you know, like, I'll, another example I'd use is if you see a problem here, we, we go this all the time, you know, it's a little bit smaller than most AAA studios. Like we don't have a massive, massive dev team. So a lot of times we got to wear different hats and you got to like be able to realize where you can jump in and fix things. So if you see a problem, don't let it fester and kind of get involved. And uh, in order to do that properly, you've got to know how to like get along with everybody. It's even respect people's positions and like, you know, and not to be corny, but like kind of like military chain of command, so to speak, you know, uh, as long as everybody's informed on something, everybody's an idea. I, I use the term all the time. Good ideas can come from anybody. Uh, I've heard good ideas from kids first job in the industry. I'm not going to shut that stuff down. So that all it, it's soft skills is a huge uh, 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 Kind of a big thing that encompasses a lot of things, but it's basically a lot of to use with ad, attitude, passion, and how you relate to people. And yeah, and more or less, you kind of said it. Are you a dick? <laughs> uh, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. And like, I'm willing to work with somebody. There's some kid that shows a little bit of promise over somebody that has this amazing reel, but he has a bad reputation of being hard to work with. And that's the last yeah. thing I want, which which sucks. But that's actually one of the saddest things that breaks my heart, dude. It's like not often all the time, but once in a while, I'll run into like somebody's work. You know, I'll never name any names or anything like that, but uh, somebody that I looked up to as an artist. Chris Kaufman. That, yeah. <laughs> you run into someone that I highly respect art-wise, and then I hear some story that they're they're kind of an asshole. You know, I don't. I, don't, I, t- I always take that as a grain of salt. I, I give everybody the benefit of the doubt until somebody screws me over, but it still bumps me out. So I, I, I always hate to hear that, but like, yeah, the dick thing. I don't. We don't want. We don't want to work with dicks. <laughs> Who does? I mean, I guess, I guess one thing because I, I do think that there's a bit of misconception. I've felt with some managers that I've worked with where they think, oh, yeah, like, you know, so and so is a dick, but we'll hire them because they're good. Oh. And they're, they're oh. not thinking about the big picture. They're thinking, oh, they're going to be difficult to work with. They're not thinking the amount of people that are going to quit yes. because of this person. And that's what you got to think about is are you willing to bring a poisonous entity into yeah. your work environment? I'd rather develop, I'd rather spend our time developing new talent, to be honest with you. That's one big, I got to tip my hat to Hugo. He's really, really good about like, uh, his process and teaching people the fundamentals of design and art and stuff like that. So like, we're kind of willing to take a chance. Like, you know, like that, that's so much of that is just feeling attitude. Like there's for example being, we're not the only studio that does this, but a lot of times when we do interviews here and stuff like that, I'll go, I'm, I'm in interview panels with, with, you know, uh, uh, for positions that I know nothing about, you know, I'm just in there mm-hmm. to kind of get a gauge on, the individual we're interviewing you know it's not some crazy psychological like well we do this weird interview it's pretty straightforward but i just want to get to know who you are man like your portfolio says everything you know, mostly what i what i need to tell i mean i gotta ask a couple questions right art wise but it's just how i how you are as a person is just everything it's it's really just that simple like honestly it's it, i'm trying to put all these words around something that's pretty straightforward it's just like modesty goes far away and like passion and don't be a dick <laughs> um so i mean that's exactly what i wanted to touch base on really quick is like have you found from uh interviewing a lot of artists you know everywhere you've worked um but like have you found uh any like common mistakes or red flags that some you know that cost people a job like they they come in either yeah what are some of the common things that just keep anybody anybody that's listening to this and you want to get a job industry don't go to a job interview and don't talk shit about where you work currently you, you think that's obvious. That is probably the most common thing I see happen. As you come in an interview and you're talking to these kids like that, and you ask them about their job, you know, there's right and wrong ways to do that. I actually really like how people answer those questions why I like to do it, because more, more often than not, when people are looking for a job, it's probably part of the reason is because they're not happy where they work. I mean, there's always like area, family, a lot of reasons why people look for new jobs. But I always like how they answer those questions. Like a smart answer will be like, well, we had these challenges. I worked around this X, Y, blah, blah, Z. But I, I, you'd be surprised how many times I hear people say like, oh, my, I've worked for this, my boss, he's an idiot, blah, 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 this. And like the, I, the management over here is terrible. And, yada, yada. and it's like, man, that is just not how you answer that question, man. <laughs> uh, but I've seen it a lot, like a lot. That's probably the number one thing I see people do is just throw like their management under the bus at their job. 
even though it might be true, there's just it's just not how you, you answer that question. Like you, it, it's it's yeah, don't do that. <laughs> um, it's kind of funny, but like I've I've had the flip side and um, a few meetups I've had with studios where they're shit talking their team or they're shit talking other people. Uh, and for me, that's like a massive red flag because yes. it's just like, whoa, great. Like, do I want to welcome my like? Do I want to end up on your radar where even if I'm doing great work, you're still gonna be that kind of personality that does that kind of shit? So I mean, it goes both ways. But like, yeah, it's 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 a pretty common. Like, I had uh, someone recently. Uh, I guess they went for a job interview, and um, yeah, they they end up like shit talking a bunch of places they worked, and I immediately got a call. And they're they're basically asking like, hey, uh, there were like a lot of red flags coming up in this person's interview. We wanted to, to see like what your opinion was because because that person worked for you at one point. And um, but yeah, it's just like, oh, really? Like what were they saying? Because um, yeah, it's just one of those things that you think that you're trying to sound cool or you know you're probably not even aware that you're doing it half the time. And I think it's just like the the most common thing is if you don't talk crap about anyone you make it that a rule and we all slip up right. we all talk shit occasionally about people but if you just make that like one effort of like I, I did a talk recently where this is exactly one of the big things that i talked about is like don't be a dick don't talk shit because you never know like who's going to find out and in general it's just not um it's not a good habit to have yes yeah, so i have to agree know. i have to, i so agree with that it's just man absolutely this talking shit it should just be off the table especially in an interview period you know plus this industry yeah. is so incestuous man like it's just mm-hmm. you know and like I, I i've seen it in my time where like i've seen people just burn as bridges and you're just like man dude you're brave like you know what i mean like you never know where that bridge is gonna lead later on and you just torch that thing <laughs> like i'm talking like like incinerated it like there's no chance of it even being built. <laughs> good luck yeah um, so I've got one more question, which is kind of the flip side. I mean, for those wanting to kind of break in the industry or even just like any advice you might have for artists who want to kind of stand out, you know, obviously it's a, especially creatures, it's a pretty oversaturated industry in terms of everyone is so freaking talented. Um, what are some of the ways that if people are um, applying for work or just in general uh, being artists trying to get noticed, like how are some of the ways that you'd recommend that they kind of get noticed or stand out as an artist? Well, I have to say it's much harder now than it's ever been. Like just the whole structure of like how people are in, in taking art. Like when I look at art station, it's just like, it's just such an onslaught of images. It's like, how do you even get noticed? How did, like, I mean, you're back when I started, it was like, you, you would get a lot of, uh, you, you would get a lot of uh, visibility by if you did got like top row at CG by central or top row CG talk. If this is t- mm-hmm. 10 years ago, but, uh, uh, because it would stay up there for a while and everybody see you. But now at our station, it's like boom, flash, boom, flash. It's almost like ADD art images. You know, it's hard. <laughs> it is hard to get stand out and notice. And um, I think it's harder now than ever, really, to probably. I mean, I, we joke, I joke around this a lot. Like, be a character artist in North America in the games industry. You know, there's more there's been jobs in the NFL. Uh, mm-hmm. So it's tough and you have to uproad row a battle. That being said, though, if you're dedicated, like, oh, harkening back to the beginning of you, we're talking about, about passion and drive. If you really, really want something, I believe you can achieve it. I've not seen, I really don't have an instance where I've run into anybody that's like said, I want to be a character artist and then really. I mean, fucking killed it, like worked their ass off and it didn't work out. Uh, and there might be, I'm sure there's people are still struggling and probably like, screw you, dude, I can bust my ass, blah, blah, blah. I'm, you know, I get it. But um, I, I teach a class over uh, at Game Art Institute. Uh, I just finished one up right there. I tell my kids in my class, uh, it's, it's online teaching, the same thing. It's that um, to stand out right now, I would, like, if you're working for my, this is the, I'm not the authority, but this is my opinion. If you want like a studio that you really want to work at, like this is like my one place, I would focus one character in their style. I wouldn't do the whole thing because then you're just catering to one company. So I would pick one character and be like, I really want to work in software. I'm going to make one demon. But the other characters, I should counterbalance that. Like if you have one creature, you, you want to go for like, I want to get a job. You know what I mean? So in my opinion, there's a couple ways you can go about this. Like do the creature for the, or whatever the character will just use its software. Do a demon for its software. Then do like, I don't know, do a human uh, character and then do something maybe a little stylized. So you're kind of like getting, a, I would say at least three. So you got range. Yeah, you got range because that's going to give you most bang for your buck. Now, if you want to just be a creature, here's the reality. Like some people are like, I just want to be a creature artist. There is, you know, jobs for that, but then you're also going to like limit yourself. But that's all you want to do. I'm not going to stand in your way. Then by all means, focus on that and go to town on it. And if you honestly, you probably still get a job. It might be a little bit harder, but, you know, it can happen. 
And, you know, I don't want to say, hey, I don't like making human characters with stuff on them. And maybe it's not fun for you. So if that's the case, then stick with what you want to do, but but do it as best you can. Uh, but I would say, I guess to sum that up is range, range in your portfolio, man. And um, and less, and less concern about like processes. At least this is for me. I mean, I have, people got and know a little bit about a 3D package. A lot of young artists nowadays are all rush. You still got to know a traditional 3D package. You don't have to know it super well, but you got to know your way around in it. Um, uh, because everything's going to use it, you know what I mean. So uh, that that would be my one thing. I see a lot of kids. It's, it's weird nowadays. Just people. If I was if we, if I was going to be a modeler now, and I started doing this like I did today. ZBrush would be I did probably the first thing you're going to pick up because it's, you get the most feedback. It's faster. You get you get sculpt things real quickly. Back when I started, that didn't exist. So I understand why people start there and then branch out from that. But I would definitely know. Uh, I would definitely focus on range your portfolio. Um, focus on the company you might want to work for, you know, and tune one to that, and then know another three package besides, you know, just just ZBrush. But quality of art is everything. Like I, I can tell you right now, like I, if someone came to me and he had this amazing a bunch of work, but he didn't know some, depending on what I knew from the position, I'm willing. I'm willing to teach people, you know, like technical stuff if they're willing. You know, because you, I, the, the build, talent is what I'm most focused on. And then the soft skills of, of like, you know, are you, you know, be able to take direction or how are you going to handle, you know, feedback, attitude and all those other things come into play also. That's awesome, man. Uh, that's been really great. And like, finally, um, if people wanted to find out more about you, um, is there any website or social media, stuff like that? To yeah, get a hold of you? you can find me at uh, jasonbmartin.com. Uh, it's also believerseaver.com. That's my website, but <laughs> websites are kind of dying these days. Uh, you can also find me on ArtStation, Jason Martin, Believer Receiver on there. Uh, yeah. That's pretty much it, really. That's awesome, man. Well, thanks again for doing this. It's been really fun. Oh, man. Oh, thank, thank you for having me, man. I really appreciate it. Man. Uh, thank you. Okay. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Again, thanks to Jason for taking the time out to chat. Uh, I definitely got a lot of really great insights from this and had a lot of fun. Hopefully, down the line, we could do a, a bit of a roundtable with... Um, like a group of people from id because i've definitely over time interviewed a bunch of uh people from there and it's definitely really cool to kind of see everyone's different perspectives i'm actually hoping and this is a bit early for me to mention it but uh, i'm really hoping to land an interview with john romero one of the original founders of id software uh talking about doom in the old days and a lot of other good stuff so um that's still in the works but i'm really really hoping that will happen i think that'd be awesome Apologies for any background noise that's going on. Uh, I'm really excited about this because obviously I've talked a lot about cold therapy in the past. And one of the key reasons I actually moved to Portland was always that I had this idea in my mind that I wanted to build a, a sauna and an ice bath next to each other and just be able to do the, the, the hot, cold transition back and forth. And um, yeah, so I've been really excited about that for the past year. And I'm finally having uh, this big sauna and ice bath being built in my yard at the moment. So that way I can go out every morning and sweat like hell and then go and freeze off in the morning and then start my day. So I'm really excited about that. It's such a, a simple tweak to my day, but I've always found just like cold therapy is like nothing else for just like boosting your energy in the morning and, and getting going. So uh, I'm getting that through its final touches at the moment. And coincidentally, it just started snowing yesterday, which um, is kind of cool too. So the sauna I have is actually um, completely glass on one side, so you can actually see out of it. So I love the idea of like freezing cold snow while you're uh, you're sitting in a, in a hot sauna sweating away. Uh, so I'm, I'm super psyched about that. But it also means I've had a lot of construction going on for the past couple of days too. Okay, so like I said, this episode is going to be really killer. Uh, on top of this, we've got a few other awesome episodes coming up. I'm interviewing one of the VFX supervisors from Scanline. Um, we get really in-depth about hiring as well as a lot of the workflow uh, at Scanline and, and how they work. Um, Scanline obviously is responsible for most of the big Hollywood movies that come out from San Andreas, 2012 transformers star wars you name it every single big destruction shot you pretty much ever see is always done by them and they work in 3ds max fume effects thinking particles uh is really cool actually we got really in depth with um 
talking about a lot of the students from my mentorship and my live action series that have gone on to working at different studios of theirs, like the Vancouver office, uh, offices in Germany, LA, and so forth. So it's really cool just to kind of talk about that because again, like my whole goal from the beginning with the live action series was to essentially make you irresistible to people hiring because essentially you're able to prove that you can do the job. There's no gamble in it. You literally can send in your work and having gone through shots from start to finish, um, it is able to showcase that you can sit down tomorrow and start doing the work. And I love that that became like an ongoing theme throughout our discussions in the episode about how learning to integrate live action and CG is like the most critical thing that you can really do because it shows that you can work within a real production pipeline. So uh, yeah, we got into a lot. It's a really cool episode. I've also got Bobby Chu, who's the founder of Schoolism, as well as Thierry LaFontaine, who is another instructor at Schoolism. And he actually runs a house at Schoolism that students will come in in like, I think groups of four and spend 30 days living and breathing art and going through this totally immersive training program with them. So uh, both of those episodes are really awesome. I was really happy to do them and uh, it's pretty inspiring. Thierry has got a background as a sommelier in uh, Quebec doing uh, wine tasting and being a a wine expert, which was, I think, really interesting. Uh, Definitely takes the cake in terms of uh, people's backgrounds going from that to then deciding later in life to be an artist and be an amazing artist at the same time. Uh, Obviously, at Schoolism, Nathan Fowkes, Justin Gobi fields a lot of other instructors um, are also speakers there uh, who have been on the podcast too. So that was a lot of fun. I've got uh, the VFX supervisor from Marvel coming up. I just finished an episode with one of the animators at Pixar who started out in the 80s as a traditional Warner Brothers animator and talking about the transition from doing the traditional art form, doing cell animation to going to 3D. And I think that was really interesting because I think that some people, especially back then, would find that really intimidating. But he was someone who was more a visionary and able to kind of see the future and know that he needed to adapt or die. So I think that that episode was really cool as well. He shared a lot of really great insights having done this for, I'm terrible at math right now, 30, 40 years, I don't know, for quite a long time. So yeah, there's so many kill episodes coming up. I'm really psyched about that. Finally, I'll just mention um, this coming month, I'm going to be launching my new website, which to me is a big deal. Um, (laughs) I've kind of not talked about it, but I mean, in a lot of ways, there's a bit of a psychology behind everything I've been doing the past two or three years where I literally, I've like hated, obsessively hated my website so much, like just how slow it is and everything else. I've just not been updating content there. So everything that I do is typically always been for my inner circle. And if you're not part of that, uh, I'll leave a link in the show notes, but just go to alanmckay.com slash inside. And so 90% of what I do on a weekly basis would always be giving information, free content, training, guides, everything exclusively for that. And it's always how I will be. But um, yeah, it's it's ba- basically been because I didn't want to drive traffic to my website at the same time. And um, so I'm really excited about the new website because I have something like 10 or 15 new guides, as well as videos, free courses. There's so much content. I want this to be literally the ultimate website for anyone who wants to get uh, their career really off the ground. And for those who are, how to really 10x your income uh, as well as your career. Um, there's going to be a lot of visual effects training. It's, it's going to be killer. So I'm really excited about that. Uh, as well as, as I mentioned, I'm launching a new course pretty soon as well. And my mentorships, those are my two big focuses right now. So there's lots going on, but I'm also going to be looking at launching a YouTube channel. I've had a YouTube channel for, uh, since the beginning of YouTube, but not really ever used it. And so I think that also is going to work hand in hand with the podcast a little bit because I'm about to rebrand the podcast um, and also try to create the episodes to be a lot shorter. So I'd like the episodes to be about 20, 30 minutes typically. Um, So there's a lot going on with that. It's definitely uh, a bit of change for me and in definitely a good way. But um, yeah, it's going to be a new YouTube channel podcast is going to be rebranded, the new website, and all the content there. Uh, yeah, there's lots, lots going on. So I'm, I'm really excited about all of that. That all being said, uh, I want to mention this stuff because obviously there is a lot of cool episodes coming up and also to give some insight into some of the things that 
also are going to be happening uh, pretty soon. So I'm about to fly to San Diego in a couple of days. I'm going to be down there for two weeks. Um, I'm going to be attending a, a bunch of events and then I'm back in Portland for a week. Then I'm off to Paris for, I think like four days, five days. And um, then I'm going to rush back and uh, yeah, finish up a few of the things I'm working on. I might be speaking at NAB this year. So I'm still going to chase that up and decide whether or not I want to go. But I think that would be a lot of fun too. Uh, yeah, so anyway, it's definitely busy right now, but all of these things affect you because this is all a chance for me to get more content, more information, more value to you as much as I can to help serve you. So this is always the, the grand scheme of things, what my big plan is. All right, so that being said, I'll be back next week with another killer episode. Thanks for listening and check out the show notes, alanmckay.com slash 129. If you want to get on to the inner circle, it's free. It's my private email list where 90% of the content that I create isn't public. It's all exclusive to that email list. So if you want to get on there, go to alanmckay.com slash inside. All right, so that's it for now. I'll be back next week. Until then, rock on.